What's the word, y'all? You know what's going on, man. Game 4 just wrapped up, and I got to do what I do, which is turn on the camera, turn on the microphone, and talk about that game. Uh, usually unscripted. I may have a couple bullet points going into it, but I ain't got no script or nothing. So if you're new around here, subscribe. And if you've been around here, be sure to leave a like. Uh, the, the growth and the love on these videos for the past couple weeks have been incredible. And let's continue to build on that, man. So Game 4 just ended. There are things in it that I enjoyed, which is like overall, for the second time in the series, we had a, a game that the fans can look at and, and say, hey, it was a good game. So that's good. So there are good things about this game, but there are also bad things. And I want to touch both after I talk about uh, not really a realization, but something I thought about halfway through this game, right? So in the second quarter, I tweeted something along the lines of Anthony Davis is picking and popping more than I want him to. You know Anthony Davis, right? He is one of the more dominant post players in the entire NBA. And as a, as a fan, again, for you guys that don't know, I'm a neutral fan in this fight. I just want good games, and I want the series to be extended at the end of the day. Don't look like that's going to happen, but you get what I'm saying. So I don't care who wins these games, but I just want the best level of basketball. And to me, the best level of Anthony Davis is when he's on the block. Right. And I see a lot of fans uh, criticizing Jimmy Butler's game four because it wasn't nearly as aggressive as game three. I understand that. But one thing I wanted to try to do is kind of look at it from a different perspective. Why aren't these things happening? Right. Why isn't Anthony Davis on the block in this game or in game three? Or why wasn't Jimmy Butler as aggressive in game four as he was in game three? When you look at it from that perspective, you kind of realize why the thing that you want isn't happening. So Iggy had said after game three that his goal when he was guarding Anthony Davis, which he had uh, the primary Anthony Davis assignment since they got rid of the zone, was to prevent Anthony Davis from touching the post, touching the lane. I think it was his exact words, which he did a damn good job of. I mean, we talk about Iggy, man, one of the greater defenders of this current generation. He literally won a finals MVP based on his defense. Again, he had a couple big moments in those two, but you get what I'm saying. He's a very good, intelligent defender. And you can look at me and say, Kenny, bro, Anthony Davis got three inches of height on him and a bunch of weight. He should probably be able to back down Iggy, which you're probably right about. But at the end of the day, Iggy's defense was just so good that it prevented Anthony Davis from getting into the paint and getting into this rhythm that he had in the first two games. Cool. I mean, at the end of the day, the pick and popping is the dagger of the game. So now I look like a fool for saying he was picking and popping too much. But on the Jimmy Butler side, now let's figure out why Jimmy Butler wasn't able to have another 40-point triple-double, which again, was the best game of his career. <laughs> and people were saying to me after that last episode when I talked to talked about it as Jimmy Butler's best game of his career, they're like, Kenny, what about that 50-point game he had against the 76ers when he was a bull? You mean the random regular season game against Philly? And that wasn't even good Philly with Ben Simmons and Joel. We're talking bad Philly where Jared Bayless was the starting guard. Sure, 50 is 50, but I'm going to take a 40-point triple-double over a 50-point against a bad team any day. So why was he not able to do that? Uh, it's because Frank Vogel and the LA Lakers had a different scheme on him. Simple as that. When in game three, they was hunting the switch. When he had a smaller defender, whether it had been Caruso, I, would, I guess Danny Green technically, uh, uh, Kenny, Kenny Caldwell Pope, I guess is what his teammate, Kenny for Kentavious? I mean, it makes sense, but it's just weird to hear. So whenever he had the smaller defender, he attacked. When he had the bigger defender, they didn't get the switch he got to maybe the lane and then he kicked out. It was it was that simple, but he made it look so, you know what I'm saying? It was that simple. But with the new changes that Frank Vogel and the Lakers had, it was Anthony Davis all the time. You weren't getting that switches to Alex Caruso. Nope, not today. I mean, it did happen sometimes, and that's where you did see Jimmy Butler get the buckets that he ended up having. But for the most part, they had Anthony Davis on him. And we know Anthony Davis, again, defensive player of the candidate, was second this year. He's always been an elite, elite defender. Um, so... Yeah, I think looking at it from a different perspective can change the way you think about the game, and I, that's something I realized today watching watching the game. So let's talk about the things that I didn't like about this game first, and then we'll transition to the good stuff. Um, the bad thing was, a, I don't think the officiating was great. I'm not. It was not the determining factor of the game. I need to get that straight. It was not the determining factor of the game, like some people like to try to make it. Sure, the Heat had a lot more free throws at one point. But if they were rigging it for the Heat, don't you think Don't you think that they would have got those free throw calls in the fourth where it matters the most? Because the Heat didn't shoot their first free throw to like three minutes left in the game, in the fourth quarter at least. So officiating was not good. But it was not the determining factor of this game. Like there was a lot of times, like for example, um, the Markeith Morris 
pull up three. Kelly Olynyk gets out of the way, but he gets he still gets called for the foul. Cool. Or like the LeBron chase down. The LeBron chase down. I look. I thought it was clean when even when they showed the replay, it was only one angle. It looked pretty clean to me, but they called it a foul. So again, it wasn't a great officiated game. It wasn't the determinative factor either, um, which is good. So officiating not good. Flopping is something that has been around as long as I've been a, a fan of basketball. This is not anything new. Um, it's not like it just started in this finals, or it's not like one team did it more than the other, or one player did it more than the other. But when you think about the NBA finals, right? The finals are supposed to be a time where the casual fan can tune into basketball and see the best versions of the NBA, right? That's what the finals is about. A casual fan should be able to tune into a finals and be like, okay, these are the best two teams. So let's see the best product. And to me, when you got all the flopping and stuff, you're not really getting the best product. You can say the same thing about the officiating. When you got a foul every 10 seconds, it's you're not getting the best product for the viewer and I mean, viewing numbers are down like 50% is what I read. Ridiculous. I, maybe we should have a whole video talking about that because there are a lot of different factors that can play into that. But 50% is kind of crazy. And I think football is only down by 4%. So it's a it's something we should have a conversation about. Maybe we have a conversation about it when the finals is over because it looks like it's going to be over sooner rather than later. But from a casual fan, I can understand you watching a quarter and see somebody fake like they get hit in the face. And you'd be like, bro, he didn't even touch you. Like, literally, he didn't even touch you, and that would turn you off to the game. Or the, the the players, right? Iggy and LeBron have to be the most complainingest players ever. Any call, any call going against them, Iggy's like, bro, we saw you scratch his eyeball, G. You fouled him. Stop it. You're. I've never understood that because it's not like a referee will see you complain, LeBron, Iggy, or whoever it may be, and think, you're right. I'm going to switch my call. This is not the way it works. So you do an and never answers any questions. Get back on defense. Let's just try to get it back. You know what I'm saying? Let's just try to get it back. You didn't get your call, or they called a foul on you. Let's just go to the next play. Uh, so those things were on display a lot. And uh, another thing that I didn't like, Kendrick Nunn. <laughs> in this game specifically, I did not like Kendrick Nunn. Um, so many instances in this game, you're like, Kendrick, Kendrick Nunn think he's playing my career. You know what I'm saying? Kendrick Nunn, I think he thinks he's playing my career. We're just trying to take the entire team, and he gets blocked, or he missed a shot, or this or that. So those are the those are the things I did not like. But the things I did like is something that I have become more conscious about over the past season or so. And it's similar to what I said earlier about like looking at it from a different perspective. But I was very curious coming into it to see how these two teams change, right? As a, as a fan two years ago, I would just come into game four and just watch it. But now I came into it like, okay, Frank Vogel has to change something, right? Jimmy Butler just tore him up. They got killed last game. Not literally, but you get what I'm saying. They got killed last game. So I came into it thinking like, mm, I'm interested to see what Frank Vogel d does to, to get his team back. And he did it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm also interested to see what Eric Spoelstra do for game five. Those are the things that I really like to see, like the little chess matches from the coaches because – I mean, in a series like this, I guess it's not going to be the determinative factor. But in some series, the little chess match ends up being the reason why a team wins a series. But in this case, I think these two teams are just kind of outmatched. You know what I'm saying? I, one team is superior, the other one's not. Kenny Carwell Pope. You know what I'm saying? Um, we were talking about Deadshot last episode. and we Mike was like, they don't call him Deadshot for no reason. But Deadshot actually hit some shots. And Kenny Carwell Pope, which is, I'm going to keep saying that until it sounds right to me. Um, timely buckets, man. One in the corner, the dunk or layup, whatever it was in transition late in the game. Just just great, great minutes from him all around. Um, I think that the body language of LeBron is the funniest thing to pay attention to, especially towards Kuzma. Specifically towards Kyle Kuzma. Just just please, just when they're on the court together, watch his body language. Because the play that I was talking referring to earlier when LeBron had to chase down block on Jimmy Butler, the reason why LeBron had to chase it down is because Kuzma was literally staring at LeBron with the ball like he had never played basketball before and then threw a telegraph pass and Jimmy Butler just picked it off. And LeBron's body language was like, and then you see him mouth and as he getting back on defense. So that one, and then there's a lot of situations where I guess the whatever scheme they planned on doing, whether it is going super under Jimmy Butler, what they did, um, Kyle Kuzma may have screwed it up and LeBron looks at him like, it's just it's always towards Kuzma when I realize it, bro. And maybe that's why the fans made that position petition so that uh Cal Kuzma doesn't get a ring for some reason. Um so also with the game plan, um, that's one thing they forced Jimmy Butler to be a shooter. He scored 40 points last game without taking a three-point shot. So whenever he did this pick and roll to try to get the smaller defender, they went so far back on it 
that Jimmy Butler had to shoot him. And we know Jimmy Butler is a below average three point shooter. So again, shout out to Frank Vogel and the Lakers for getting this new game plan to get themselves up on the three one. I don't have to tell you the significance of this being up three one, but it's really good in the playoffs and especially in the finals. I mean, we've only seen it happen one time where a team has come back. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility, Heat Nation, but I'm saying it's unlikely. I would not be surprised if this series is ended by Friday, honestly. And I'm looking into my notes because I do have a few things sometimes. Um, for example, I have Duncan Robinson. They actually got this. Oh, yes. So the Lakers got to switch into Duncan Robinson a lot. My notes would say Duncan Robinson switch, and then I got to put together now what I meant. They did get to switch into Duncan Robinson, something that they weren't able to do in game three. And then when LeBron sees Duncan Robinson in front of him, it's basically like he's being guarded by 5'7", Kenny Beecham. It's just a cook session, bro. It's, it's an easy bucket. You know what I'm saying? It's an easy bucket. But there's a stretch in this game, and this will be the one of the last things I talk about, where we saw LeBron James take over, and maybe not in the traditional sense. It wasn't like he dropped 21 straight points in, in, for his team like he did back in whatever year that was. But instead, in the third quarter, there was a possession where he got a steal up to Danny Green for a dunk. Boom. Next possession, they get the stop. LeBron does the little, oh, you're not going to guard me? Look, you know how he always look when he's about to do that step back three? He did that, hit the step back three, boom. Um, and then he had one more shot in the lane, timeout Miami Heat. And then coming out of the timeout, he has scored again. So we're talking about LeBron James having f- five. Uh, mathematically, he had like double-digit points straight for his team, like 10 points when you count the assists. Um, and again, that, that 10 points didn't like flip momentum dramatically or anything, and maybe it went under the radar for some people. But as a fan of LeBron, seeing him take over like that was really, really cool because uh, we haven't really seen that in the in this series specifically just yet. So to see that, even if it was at a small or little situation, was cool. Um, Anthony Davis was on his way to looking like last game where he like, man, they're really playing him out of the series. But then he turned it up crazy. The, some of the turnaround baseline shots he hits is ridiculous. I just saw a pie chart of like his field goal percentage in the finals. Ridiculous. It's all green. He was 0 for 1 in the corner three this series. But other than that, green everywhere. Shooting like 60% from everywhere else. Ridiculous. Um, so shout out to him for that. And then LeBron was in a similar situation too where it's like, Early in the first quarter, I was like, wow, the Heat might have really found a solution to stopping LeBron. I think he had like four turnovers in the first quarter. He just wasn't looking good. But then again, like I said, he turned it up, and they end up getting that victory. It was not a pretty one. It was not a pretty victory, but a victory is a victory, and we might be seeing that five-game series that many people predicted. I hope not. I mean, again, as a fan of basketball, I want as much of it as possible. Um, but if it ended in five, I could reflect on this season and say that it was a good one. The longest season I've ever been a part of. I mean, I think the first game last year was October something. We're in October talking about the finals. So uh, that's all I really have for this game. Looking forward to game five and maybe the Heat, you know, pick themselves up and and change it and make it a game six. I don't really know. Either way, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, leave it a like. Subscribe if you're new. Let me know what you thought about game four and your remaining predictions for this series. I'm going to see a lot of uh, Lakers and five in the comment section. I'm already knowing. But I'm going to read it anyway.